So I've seen even like market garden farms have this because it, it makes such a big difference in ensuring that it doesn't dry out, that it's the right humidity level, it's the optimal temperature, especially in a greenhouse where like, you know, in the spring, if, if you're starting like onion seedlings in February, it's gonna be pretty cold in your greenhouse. So by having a germination chamber, they call it, but you can just build one, a germination room. Uh, and pretty much all you would need to do to do that is you can. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we are answering your questions from social media, everything from food safety advice, organic certification recommendations, how much to water your microgreens, and so much more. Stay tuned. We have a great episode for you today. So the first question is, do you have any advice on preventing salmonella, E. coli, and listeria? Any methods or protocols you recommend? So yeah, so it's definitely important um, to have some sort of protocol in place for preventing these type of pathogens that you know can make people sick. So as a farmer, I think it's you know important to make sure that you're aware of uh, how these things spread. And um, you can, you know, of course, take basic food safety training. There's videos on YouTube, or you can take a more professional course. Um, but from the bare bones basics, the main things you want to do are make sure that the seed you're buying and the soil you're buying are clean of contaminants. So you don't want to be using, for example, um, cow manure, uh, composted cow manure in your soil uh, as much as possible because those would increase the risk of things like salmonella and E. coli, which is generally how it spreads in, uh, you know, large scale farms is there'll be like a big flood in a, you know, area in Arizona near where there's uh, animal agriculture. And then that, that waste will spread in the water to a lettuce farm, you know, a few miles down the road. Um, so that's generally how these type of things spread uh, on, you know, mass production farms. So it's generally a lot easier to control them in uh, an indoor facility. You don't have animals pooping anywhere or things like that that can be spread uh, by birds or, or other animals, which is great. So it eliminates a lot of the risk. Um, but the seed is really important to make sure you're getting a clean source of seed. You want to make sure you're disinfecting anything that comes in contact with the final product, like the cut product. So this includes your knife. If you're using a knife, your harvester, any sort of bins you store the product, um, if you're using any sort of uh, reusable gloves, those definitely need to be disinfected. Your hands should be washed every time you touch the product, whether it's harvested or, you know, just, um, you know, you're, you're, if you're taking off the hulls of sunflower in your grow during the growing time, you definitely want to make sure your hands are clean. So um, a lot of it's very, very basic, um, but it's really important to do so. Definitely recommend for anyone that uh, wants to learn more about this is just, you know, watch some YouTube videos on uh, basic food safety. There's lots of that available online. The next question is, um, Promix HP is half the cost of MP. Can someone use MP and still be considered organic? Um, so the first thing is MP should not be twice as expensive um, as HP. Um, so if that's the case, then I would try to find different suppliers of MP in your local area because it should only be maybe 10 to 30% more expensive, not double. Um, but if you, if you, if you are using HP, um, it, as far as I know, in Canada, the U S you cannot be considered certified organic because you in, in HP has two things, um, that prevent you from being certified organic. One is, um, there's a, a soapy like material, uh, a surficant, which allows the peat moss to absorb the water much more easily than if it was just pure peat moss. So that is a, a you know, it is a, a chemically derived, um, soap pretty much. And then the other ingredient would be the chemical fertilizer that they add in. So they, they add a starter charge to the HP and that's going to uh, not allow you to get certified organic using that soil. So MP is a certified organic soil. They use coconut coir and an organic surficant uh, to allow the water to absorb. And they use some sort of organic fertilizer that's allowed as a starter charge. But again, it's neither of the fertilizers are enough to grow a, a good tray of microgreens. So you definitely want to be adding in um, the fertilizer to get the super soil recipe, whether using MP or HP. If you want to be 
certified organic, there are other ways you can do it as well, including just buying straight peat moss and then adding all your uh, ingredients, including dolomitic limestone, uh, your nutrients, perlite, vermiculite. So you can definitely do that if you want. It's just, it's a lot easier to just buy MP because the amount of pretty much time it's going to take to mix all these ingredients together without a soil mixing machine is probably going to not be worth the extra time. So it's easier just to buy MP if you want to be organic. And there's other companies as well, besides ProMix that makes um, certified organic potting medium. Next question is, have you experimented with dehydrating microgreens? So I have a long, long time ago when I started out, um, I would use like a standard dehydrator. That's just like a multi-level unit that you just put a bunch of greens in and then just hot air kind of blows through it and dries it out. It just, for, for me, it wasn't really worth it. Um, and I know there's a lot more farms that are doing like freeze dried microgreens because you, I think the nutritional benefit of freeze drying over dehydrating is that it, you're, you're keeping all the nutrients. You're not heating it up. You're literally freezing it in its current state when you harvest it and extracting out the water. Uh, so it's just the dry material left, which is what all the nutrients would, would, would still be in. Whereas when you dehydrate it, it's degrading the microgreens over that eight hour or 12 hour period that it's being dehydrated. Um, so if you have extra as a grower and you just want to be able to, you know, have something for yourself, totally fine. But to try to sell it, um, as a product is starts getting more challenging because then it's almost like you're running another business. So there are farms that are doing it that, uh, are successful doing it, but it's far and few between like it's, it, you're much better off spending your time growing your, your business, selling fresh microgreens. Um, than trying to make a business model of selling fresh migraines and then using all the waste product um, to dehydrate them. You're better off using the waste product to get more customers by giving them out as samples would be what I would think would make the most sense given the, uh, the extra labor involved and marketing and everything else involved in selling uh, another product that's related to migraines, but all at the same time, not really, because it's a whole different market for drying dried green powders compared to fresh microgreens. Next, how much vermiculite should we use over the seeds? Should the seeds be covered? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So generally speaking, you're gonna wanna roughly use about half a liter to one liter of vermiculite to top coat the seeds. And this really depends on how large the seeds are. So if you have like things like pea seeds, you're probably gonna need a liter, maybe even a bit more. And then if you're using like seeds like broccoli or uh, amaranth or basil, things like that, really small seeds, half a liter should be sufficient to cover the, the tray. Now it's okay if the, tr if, it, if you, like you still see some soil, um, the seeds don't need to be like completely covered. I find it's nice as, as just like a target, uh, especially when you're training staff is to try to have it so that it's the least amount possible of vermiculite that covers the seed. So if you see a few seeds, not a big deal, but you don't want to see across the board, um, you know, you don't want to see like seeds all over the place uh, on your tray because that means you probably didn't put enough. Even a small amount will help. So you can do some experimenting and see if you do like, you know, a quarter of a liter, like, you know, uh, 250 mil or something, if, if it helps with mold. Uh, I just kind of went straight to covering the seeds. So I actually don't know what the effectiveness is of using less than like half a liter. But for anyone that wants to try it, uh, vermiculite's not the cheapest material. So it's nice if there's a way to reduce the cost of the vermiculite, but I wouldn't reduce the cost at the expense of the benefit of reducing mold and increasing germination. So it's definitely worth its weight um, in, in cost to use it sufficiently to cover the seeds. Next question is, what is the typical revenue for different customer types? For example, direct to consumer delivery customers, restaurants, retail stores, and distributors. Uh, so this is a, this is a great question. I, I can't give an exact number for this. I can give ranges of roughly, but you'll always have outliers and you'll have, you know, outliers on both sides. So, um, take it with a grain of salt. This has just been my experience. So direct to consumer will generally on average be about $20. I would recommend having a minimum of $20 because it starts getting really not worth your time. If you're selling $10 worth of microgreens, when you account for all the costs, including delivery. So $20 would be 
the the minimum. So I would say the average is would be roughly twenty to twenty five dollars, and you may have some customers go up to you know fifty, uh, but you probably won't have many customers go above the fifty dollar price point because that's quite a bit of microgreens for one person or one family to consume. Unless sometimes you get like these really hardcore customers that are like super into like health and wellness. Um, and they just want to consume as many microgreens as they can because they, they understand the benefits. So you have those rare situations, but again, those are the outliers. So generally $20, $25, and then up to $50. With restaurants, it would be a bit higher. It would be anywhere from, you know, on the low end, I probably wouldn't sell to a restaurant for less than like $50 a, a week in order. Um, and that's pretty low up to a hundred sometimes you'll get like you know if it's a bigger restaurant you can get up to like a couple hundred dollars maybe even more per per order during the uh busy season and that's if you have like a, a really good restaurant that is putting microgreens on on a lot of their dishes or they're just a really big restaurant now retail stores um it's a, it's a level up from that so generally you're going to have on the really small end um, I also wouldn't sell for less than $50 to a retail store. And that's pretty rare unless it's like a really, really small, like mom and pop, super small town, small store kind of retail store. Generally speaking, you'll, you'll, you'll find it'll be generally between a hundred and a thousand dollars per store, depending on the size of the store. So a hundred dollars would be a smaller health food store. A thousand dollars would be potentially more of a, a chain kind of store or a just really busy grocery store in your local area. And then next is distributors. So distributors also, you know, there's a big range of, uh, you know, types of distributors and sizes. And, you know, you can have a distributor that never carried microgreens and then they want to carry your microgreens. So it's a complete gamble on how much product they're actually going to move. Whereas, you know, I always like to target customers that are already using microgreens in some capacity because um, then you have a better sense of what the demand will actually be. So for distributors, is it would generally be between like $200 and $2,000 a week, depending on the size. And then it can go way up from there, depending on the type of distributor. So if, if you're, you know, most major cities have something called a food terminal, uh, where there's like a congregation of a lot of different big wholesalers that import produce and sell it across the, you know, the city or region you're in. Uh, and those kind of distributors at food terminals can easily sell like 10,000 plus uh, a week, if not, if not more. Um, so there's a huge range there, but this just gives you a typical range for the different customer types. So I hope that helps you with, with planning and understanding where the market potential is for different customer types. The edges of my pea shoot trays are growing well, but the center is really short. Why is this happening? Um, yeah, so this is a really common issue that people face early on. So there's there's either where it's growing really well in the center and then the edges are not growing well or they're growing really well on the edges, but then the center is not doing well. So in the latter, which is where the edges are um, doing well, but the center is not, meaning that they're not they're not germinating well, they're just growing slower, is from overwatering. So it's 99% of the time it will be from overwatering, meaning that the tray is holding so much water and the center of the tray is always going to hold the most amount of water and the edges are going to hold the least amount of water. So if the edges are doing well and the center is doing uh, poorly, like it's growing really short or not even germinating at all, that means that um, there's just too much water. So dial back watering during germination and post germination and you should fix that issue. Now, um, if, if you have the other issue where the center is doing really well, but the edges of the tray are really dry, that's pretty much uh, the opposite where it's underwatering. So the center holds the most water. It's doing well. It's growing well, but the edges are dry means that there's not enough water and you should increase the amount of water during germination and uh, post germination. And that will 100 percent solve the issue. And it's really just about dialing in um, how much water at different stages of growth, which really only takes you know, a few grows generally to, to get a good sense of that. Um, and uh, one one good thing about microgreens is the learning curve is can be steep sometimes, but it's really fast. So if you're a tomato farmer, it's going to take you 20 plus years to perfect a growing recipe for your tomatoes. If you're growing pea shoots, you grow pea shoots for, you know, half a year, you're going to be an expert at growing pea shoots because you've grown 26 times now. Um, so there's that, that's a good thing. So you should be able to dial this in pretty fast uh, once you understand that that is the issue. 
So hope that helps. Next question is, where is the best place to find vermiculite? Um, this will depend on your local area. Generally speaking, going to your local hydroponic store will probably be your best bet. Now, I always recommend using uh, a fine vermiculite, like the chunky vermiculite that usually you're going to find at garden centers or hydroponic stores is not going to really do the trick for, you know, if you're using it to put it on top of the seeds to prevent mold and increase germination. So you really need to find the specific type of vermiculite that's a fine grade. It's almost like a, more like a powder than, than like, like a chunky material. And if they don't have it at the hydroponic store, they should be able to order it for you from the distributor. Now, if you're using a lot of volume, you could just go straight to like, you know, uh, a distributor that carries vermiculite and you'll get much better pricing. But for smaller growers, just going to a hydroponic store is the best way. If you don't have a hydroponic store near you, you can always go to a garden center and just be like, Hey, I need fine vermiculite. Are you guys able to order for me if you don't have it? And generally speaking, if you're using it for like commercial growing, you want to get the four cubic foot bag. So it's about 113 liters. And that size bag is the most efficient way to get vermiculite unless you're like a really big farm. So those small bags that are like 20, 30 liters, you're going to be paying a huge premium for that. So you really want to find a source uh, in those bigger bags because it'll be much less expensive per, you know, liter of vermiculite. Do you recommend purchasing an indoor growing enclosure for germinating seeds? So generally speaking, if you're just starting out, I would say this is an extra step you don't need. If you're a larger scale farm, there are definitely benefits to having an enclosed space that's dedicated to germinating seeds. So I've seen even like market garden farms have this because it, it makes such a big difference in ensuring that it doesn't dry out, that it's the right humidity level, it's the optimal temperature, especially in a greenhouse where like, you know, in the spring, if, if you're starting like onion seedlings, in February, it's going to be pretty cold in your greenhouse. So by having a germination chamber, they call it, but you can just build one, a germination room. Uh, and pretty much all you would need to do to do that is you can either use like a grow tent. Some people use that. Uh, you can just build with wood and uh, six mil polyplastic that's used as a vapor barrier for homes and just enclose that. Um, and then you just want to wait for airflow to flow in and out so you can kind of keep track of the temperature. So you can have exhaust fans and get really fancy with it. But honestly, just opening the door and having like one small fan just circulating the air is all you really need. The warmth of the seeds germinating and the actual humidity from the trays will like increase the humidity and temperature in your germ room. So generally speaking, unless you're growing in like a cold basement or something, you shouldn't need to heat it. Um, but again, this is only recommended when you have some sort of scale. I would not spend the time if you have like one, two, three, even four racks, it's just not worth it. Um, so it's really when you're at like, you know, maybe 10 racks or more that it starts making sense to actually have like, you know, think about making or buying uh, indoor germination tent or, you know, germination chamber sort of thing. Cause it, it for, pretty much for, for, for me, I found it reduced germination by one day on, on some very key crops. So it, it, it can make a big difference. Cause let's say if, if in theory, it takes three days to germinate broccoli, um, and you can get it down to two days and it's a 10 day growing cycle then you can have an extra day under light or reduce it by a day in the growing cycle. And if you can get, let's say a crop that's normally two weeks and, and, and you can get it down to one week under lights, that can be a huge benefit in terms of you double the amount of actual trays you can grow in your space. So if you're at like the edge, let's say there's a crop that is eight days under lights, and by increasing the germination, you can get it down to seven days under lights because it's growing faster from that germination period. Then you, you know, then you have 52 crops instead of 26, which can be a huge benefit. So depending on the situation there, it may make sense, but it's really only at larger scale, like 10 racks plus, I would recommend doing it. Next question is what are the best lights for growing microgreens? So, uh, this is, this is a difficult question to answer accurately because it, it changes literally like weekly, there's so many grow light companies out there selling like the newest technology and the, the changes in the LED market is, I can't keep up with it to be honest. Um, but from a cost perspective, like cost versus output, the Barina LEDs, it, it, they're literally like $25 a light fixture now. 
So it's sometimes even less. Uh, sometimes I've seen them for like twenty dollars and less when you when you buy the six pack of the four foot fixtures. So it's pretty hard to beat that just because like if you bought a light that generally like good grow lights are going to be like a hundred dollars a grow light. So you're talking about four times the cost. It's pretty hard to justify spending that much extra, um, you know, for the electricity savings and for the higher potential higher yields, because the Barinas are pretty good for microgreens. They're not perfect, but if you space them between 10 and 12 inches, you're getting a pretty good light level. So, um, just from a cost perspective, I recommend that because then one, if you're spending less on your lights, then it's a lot faster for you to recuperate your investment and then your business becomes profitable faster. So when I started, I was paying like a hundred bucks for my LEDs. Um, I think it was, yeah, roughly around that. And now if I were to start out in 2024, I would use the Barino lights for sure, which I actually am at home. I have, that's what I'm using for all my testing uh, and they're, the crops are doing fantastic. Approximately how many cups of water would you say you give your trays when you water them? Yeah, this is, this is a really good question. Um, and because uh, when I had Living Earth Farm, I wasn't watering by hand. So it was hard for me to give an accurate measurement. But now that I've been doing more hand watering with the system I have at home, um, I would say generally between half a liter and one liter of water is what I would recommend. And it depends on the crop. So, um, and that would be roughly every other day. So what the last testing I was doing, I was pretty much doing one liter and watering every two to three days, depending on the crop. So that's what I'd recommend to, to start out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how to grow pea and sunflower without mold? Yeah, so a lot of people run into this. I ran into it um, for sure in the early years. And there's a few things. Number one is the seed is for sure the most important thing, especially for sunflower. So a lot of people grow um, where the cheapest seed is they can find. Some people even go to like health food stores and buy the black oil sunflower seed there. Definitely don't recommend doing that. You want to buy from a reputable seed company um, because they're going to check the germination rate. They're going to check the quality. Generally speaking, I'd recommend for sunflower like Johnny's or high mowing would be a, a good bet to get a consistent high quality sunflower seed. And like, there's a lot of people that bought from other suppliers and have switched to Johnny's um, in the Freedom Farmers course that that I teach. And just, yeah, it's like night and day, their experience. So you, you can have a lot of issues with mold and struggle growing sunflower, and then you switch to a good seed. And all of a sudden it's like a, a, a magical solution to, to this problem, but it really just comes down to, if you have a crappy seed, it's gonna be hard to grow a good quality microgreen. And with peas, um, peas are much more resilient to mold, but specific varieties, like I've grown, um, like snow peas and Oregon giant peas and all these different varieties of peas that were more prone to mold than a speckled pea, which is what most people grow for, for pea shoots. So you can still run into mold issues with pea, especially with the density of the seeds that you're planting. So the quality of seeds really important because uh, there's a lot of energy, like there's a lot of calories in pea seeds. So um, if a lot of them don't germinate, they're going to mold because it's just a great nutrient source for the mold. So by having a good quality seed on pea and sunflower makes a big difference. The second thing I would say is using vermiculite on top of the seed will just really keep that mold level like almost almost nil, but close to zero, if not zero. So that those two tips are really like what I think are the solution to having mold on really any microgreen, but specifically pea and sunflower, which are more prone to it. The next question is, how clean does a basement grow setup need to be to avoid fungus and sanitation issues? So this, this is a little bit of a more complex question to answer. So a lot of people think like if your basement is unfinished, that means it's not going to be a good uh, place to grow microgreens. And I don't think that's true at all. I don't think it really matters if it's finished or not finished. What you really care about is airflow, that it's, you know, there's not like a ton of dust flying up from the floor, which is really for anything. You don't want like a ton of pet hair and things like that that are gonna land on, on your crops. And then, you know, all you really need is some fans to move air around to prevent fungus. And then sanitation is really pretty much focused on disinfecting things and keeping things clean, your trays, using high quality soil, um, disinfecting your 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 grow trays, your um, any sort of harvesting equipment, anything you store the microgreens in, any sort of reusable gloves, all that sort of stuff. You want to disinfect. 
but yeah, you like you shouldn't really run into a lot of of issues because it's in a, a basement, whether it's finished or not finished. Keep in, keep in mind that basements generally have naturally higher humidity levels because all the cold air that holds less moisture will sink to your basement. So you'll generally have higher relative humidity levels. So you might need to have a dehumidifier earlier on. So some people might want to get a dehumidifier right away. I would check what the humidity levels are. If they're above 50% without having anything growing in there, then you should definitely get a dehumidifier because once you have plants growing, it's going to get above 60 and above 60 is when it starts getting not so safe for like molds and stuff to are much easier to reproduce. So you don't want anything like that growing on your walls or uh, in your space. So humidity under 60% is important and it's really easy to do that. You just get a dehumidifier. So if it's, if your basement is, you know, 40% or 45% or less without anything growing in it, you'll probably be okay. Uh, unless you're planning to grow like, you know, 10 racks in your basement sort of thing. If you're just growing one or two, it won't increase the humidity enough that you'll run into any sort of mold or fungus issues in the air. Next question is when you started out, meaning me, I guess, was there any significant demand for organic versus non-organic microgreens? And do you think that there's still enough demand and higher prices to justify organic certification? Yeah, this is a, this is a really good question. Um, I think the market has changed and I think it's changed because of vertical farming, like lettuce farming and, and, uh, you know, basil and all these other kind of crops that are grown in vertical farms, this whole uh, no pesticide, no spray environment has really changed the the dynamic of what people really want. Um, and people seem to be like the consumer in general seems to be more okay with using chemical fertilizers and just having it not be sprayed in hydroponic vertical farms. So what I've seen over the last 10 years as more of these vertical farms have popped up is that less and less stores and customers are requiring you to be certified organic. Um, so there's, there's less need for it. So when, when I started, I had to because there were some customers that were really big potential customers that wanted me to be certified organic in order to sell. So I could not sell them unless I was certified organic. So for me, it was more about it made sense from a business perspective to do so. Now. The market has, has like I, as I said, shifted. And there's definitely increasing demand for organic produce in general, but there's less uh, requirement that you need to have it be certified organic. So it really depends. I, I personally think that growing microgreens certified organic just makes sense because the only difference between the way I would grow it non-organic and organic would be the seed. So the soil, the super soil recipe, there is nothing I have found that's even remotely close that's hydroponic or you know, anything else that will give anywhere close to the quality and whether you're organic or not organic, the quality is number one. So I would still be using the super soul recipe and using like non-organic seed if I was not organic. Um, the, and the cost difference is pretty minimal in the grand scheme of things. Like you're talking about 20, 30% maybe on the cost of your seed and then everything else is the same. So if you can, if you think you can get a higher price point, by growing certified organic, the cost difference is not gonna be much in terms of production changes uh, in the way I would recommend doing it to get the highest quality, most nutrient dense microgreens. So given that I would probably at least grow it certified organic. And if you're selling direct to consumer, then there's no need to get the organic certification. You can just say, hey, I'm using everything organic. It just doesn't make sense at my scale to get organic certified. Really the only time you wanna get organic certified is when you're selling um, not directly to the end consumer. So if you're selling to restaurants or you're selling to direct to consumer delivery or farmer's markets, there's absolutely no need to get certified organic. If you're selling to retail stores or distributors, then there's a much bigger benefit of being certified organic because the end consumer that's buying it has no idea how you're growing it. Like realistically, unless you're going to put all this text on your package saying all these different like growing methods, which realistically is going to be difficult to do and make a nice looking packaging as well. Um, you're limited in how much you can express to your customers through packaging. So uh, having that certified organic logo is just like a stamp of approval saying, hey, we don't spray pesticides. We use organic fertilizers. We take care of our soil sort of thing. Like that's the general message that having that stamp gives you to a customer or a consumer. But I don't know if that's necessarily 
um, required in retail stores. Like I said, it's less of an issue now. So I wouldn't focus too much on getting that organic certification unless you're a really big scale farm and you see that there's demand for organic beyond non-organic microgreens. So I hope answering these questions helps you guys on your microgreens journey. If anyone's interested in taking a full business in a box course on how to grow and sell microgreens from your home, feel free to check out jonah.freedomfarmers.com to watch a completely free webinar on how to get started from home today. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.